the OE, the XL, and the signature series oils. Three families. One is a normal drain interval oil, OE. XL is a 10,000 mile drain oil. And the signature series is 25,000 miles, or one year. Now, Anvil has gone to great lengths to give us a 0W20, a 5W20, a 0W30. Well, let's take that back. There isn't a 0W30 down in the other ones. But a 5W20 and a 5W30 and 10W30. The only place you find a 0W30 is in the signature series. But in the other oils, we now have 0 20, 5 20, 5 30, and 10 30. Listen, Ansel's intent there is for us to take any customer and say, what's your comfort zone? Yeah. Where do you want to be? Do you want to just drive normal drains? Do you want to drive a bit longer, but you're afraid of a 25,000 mile drain? Where is your comfort zone? You realize that half the people in this world don't even know what you're talking about. And that's, I see that as a challenge because when you start getting into this, they don't even want to hear it. Book says 5 till you're 20. Book says 5 till you're Right, 30. right. All I want to know is what the book says. Forward. And that's got the new forwards. The 20. Well, that's right. But that is more of what Amazon's doing. It's saying, look, you don't have to convince them of nothing. If their book says 5 to 20, here's a 5 to 20. If the book says 0 to 20, here's a 0 to 20. If it says 5 30, here's a 5 to 30. They're taking the onus off of us to have to explain to the customer why he can use a certain oil. But Gar we can also use two other oils. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. Because right. we're not below zero here at all. No. Never. 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 And if you look at uh, one of the good things is that in the signature series oil, having that 5W20 signature series oil, that's because of people have been asking for that oil ever since we came out with the 5W20 XL. They've always wanted to know where's the 5W20 Where's the 5W20 in the 25,000 mile oil? So we have that. Now, let's just, since we're on this topic, first of all, let's do some more questions because I, that's part of the topic that I want to continue on later. I want to ask a very generic question. Sure. I'm trying to wrap my arms around the synthetic oil. Now, is the OE, the XL, and the signature all basically the same synthetic oil with additives to change within the viscosities? That is a really good question. I, I need to know. No, it is. And, because and when I talked to a municipality yesterday, he asked me, well, you know, I use a middle grade synthetic. Well, hell, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Right. Because right. If, if the OE is the same thing as the XL, is the same thing as some, you know, as the signature, right. In effect, did I just move him up in additives? No, let me explain something to you, and I'll be as brief as I can on it, but it's good information for everybody. Uh, synthetic oils, there are a variety of what we would call base stocks that are called synthetic. Okay. okay. Now, the original definition of synthetic was taking two lightweight molecules and forming a heavyweight lubricating molecule, synthesizing a heavyweight molecule from lightweight molecules. It was a chemical process, and I had to be careful. I have an old retired chemist over here who used to be a chemistry instructor at college, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> Chuck knows that stuff. But here, I want to explain. This. If you look at, Mobile used a term for years, they call their oil synthetic hydrocarbons. It's a term they use, SHC. You'll even see it some of their oil. SHC 622, SHC 482, these, these oils they have. Synthetic hydrocarbons, okay? Now, that's a term they were using because you can make, if I take hydrogen and carbon and I synthesize them into a particular product, it is a synthetic product because I made it. It was not a natural product in nature. I put together this this compound that I have. My cup there, the outside of that cup, is a synthetic compound from petroleum called plastic. It is a synthetic product because it is not a natural product of nature. It is made by synthesizing molecular products into something. So that's what we're doing in synthetic. We're making something. Okay, now, in the I'll, I'll give you a little history of it, and then we'll come right back and finish the question. Okay. Uh, to make 
synthetics, one of the first places that they got really interested in making synthetics was in World War II, the German Army. Okay, don't worry about that thing, we'll bring it back in a minute. The German Army uh, did not have access to a lot of petroleum. So they had to make products to substitute. They made what they called, uh, roughly called potatoing. It was making an alcohol-based fuel out of potatoes, like making vodka, but going a step further and making fuel, okay? Then, since they had this alcohol they made, they decided they would use a process called an esterification process, and they would make an ester as a base for lubricating oil. Good scientists, German scientists. So they made it, okay? And esters have been around for a long time. Esters is, is a, it's just a chemical name for a product that's made from alcohol. Or you can use another substance. But alcohol is, easy, is an easy feedstock that you can turn into different kind of esters. And I guess all they do is they react a particular acid with the alcohol and it es does an esterification and it makes esters. Esters are a type. That's one base stuff, esters, right? All right. Another type are called um, big name polyalpha olefins. Short name, PAOs. These are synthetic hydrocarbons, PAOs. Now, you guys wanna know how they're made? I'll tell you how they're made. They take some natural gas, they clean it up real good, they run it into this unit. They call it a reactor type unit. It has certain catalysts in it, and it creates, takes these hydrocarbons and turns them into long chain, what they call oligomers. Same thing with plastic out of them. Oligomers, right? Okay, that's out the other end. How do they do it? Look, uh, however the catalyst makes this stuff react, it goes in this end. It goes from a vapor to a solid. Well, it goes from liquid. Uh, well, I don't know if they liquefy the natural gas or if they push it in there as a vapor. I think they would liquefy it. Put it in. Under pressure. Okay. And it goes through and it comes out. Now, listen, you can make, you can use different feedstocks, but natural gas is a winner when it comes to making these things because it's so plentiful, it's natural and you can convert it into these PAOs. Now, PAOs are simple little molecules. They can be what they call a PAO2. There's two of them hung together, two, four, six, eight, ten. They get bigger. So when we make these oils, I can take a polyalpha olefin that is a certain size molecule, blend that together, and it will result in a 30-weight oil, okay, because of its molecular size. But that's a 30-weight oil across the 38 oil, oil board, or is that just one particular product? In no, other words, that's, that's a base. That's, that's a, a base. base of oil, meaning that it, it can be used, and I can take a PAO4 and make a 20 weight oil out of it. Okay. And I can make a PAO12 and make a 50 weight oil out of it. But that PAO4 can be in the XLE, the OE. Okay. I'll come into that. All right. So we have esters, PAOs, and that, folks, was the primary synthetic base stocks available in the industry up until 19, is it 95 time? Remember the Castro suit? 95, 97, somewhere there, okay. It was later, it was later than that. Yeah. It hadn't been, had been like 97. 97, 98, yeah. Uh, we, and what happened was, was that uh, when you go to a refinery and you make oil, okay, without getting into the details on that, it's cracked off by weight, comes in, it's heated up, you get rid of this stuff, you get rid of that stuff, you have residual asphalt that you get rid of that comes out the bottom. All this stuff is separated really by its volatility and molecular weight. And then out comes the stuff they call gas oil, which is really the crude oil cleaned up and that's now available to go make other stuff out of it. Okay, now, that oil goes over here and in a cleanup process for lubricating oil, uh, they'll clean it up and make it pretty good and put some additives in it and that's the old fashioned Group one, it's called petroleum based stock. Okay. Uh, there's a process with this oil called hydrocracking that is a good process. It, it's been around a number of years, and the idea is you take this, this base stock of petroleum, you bring it in, and you do some more cleaning to it, and you cut it off by weight because you can actually separate uh, by molecular weight in a good cracking tower. Then you take this feedstock out here and you go, okay, I'm gonna hydrocrack this stuff, Marty. And what I do is I take it and I raise it to 3,000 pounds per square inch and I heat it to 1,000 degrees. 
it goes from liquid through vapor to gas. Then I say, all right, I got all this stuff that's gaseous molecules, right? What am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to get rid of anything in this that doesn't match up with a lubricating molecule that I want that's a natural hydrocarbon. And so what I end up doing, again, I go to use what they call a, what's that thing called that separates by weight, molecular weight, you know. Uh, a centric? No, it's not that. These things, they, they cut it off in them. As it comes, it's got a, like a membrane. Certain sizes can go through it. It's a separator. Anyway, it works. What they do is they take all these wonderful, cleaned up, I mean, pure base out of this. And you go, wow, that's a pretty good looking stuff. And it is. It's the best you can get out of natural oil. Now, here comes the part they do to it that allows them to call it a synthetic base stuff. Before they condense the gas, they blast it with hydrogen. Okay. Hence, hydrocracking. Now, when the hydrogen is blasted into this thing, in your molecular structure of hydrocarbons, they all hook together, they look really nice, right? Hydrogen, carbon, they all hook it together. They leave what they call open sites of polarity on that molecular chain. And what that means is that if I've got an open site of polarity, everybody know what the most reactive element in our atmosphere is? Hydrogen. Oxygen. Oxygen. Oh, okay. Oxygen. Oxygen has a big negative two sitting on it, meaning it reacts with anything that's positive. So if this hydrogen and carbon goes along here, and bang, I left open a site, and there's a positive site left here. If I take that product out here into the, into the world, it's going to be oxidized like that because the oxygen is just going to come in and hit it as soon as it gets there. But guess what the, you do with monatomic hydrogen? It has a negative one. Oxygen out here has negative two, but you bring that little hydrogen in there, boom, plant it on that positive site. It's called depolarizing all of the base stock. That makes it so it won't react with oxygen readily, right? Now, that step is what made Castrol win in its suit, court case with Mobile, to call hydrocracked oil synthetic. Was we changed the molecular structure by adding hydrogen, therefore we have synthesized a new molecular structure, it is synthetic. Well, Mobile said, you gotta be out of your mind, this can't be true, and what Mobile warned when they went through this court case, they just said, look, uh, we're not arguing you can make good hydrocarbon oil, because you can. You can make really good hydrocarbon base stock, but you can make really lousy hydrocarbon base stock and get away with calling it synthetic and it's cheap to do. And Mobile warned when they lost that case, they said this is a case that will open up uh, deception and uh, cheating in the market, which the consumer will suffer. Because the consumer will not know when they're getting junk that's called synthetic because to hydrocrack this thing, how well do you hydrocrack it? Do you really go 100% vapor and hydrocrack it or do you wave the wand over, bring it out the end and call it hydrocrack? So, therein lies our situation. XL and OE oil are primarily made of this synthetic hydrocrack oil because 99% of the entire market is now made from this process, and it's less expensive to make than those PAOs or esters. So what are you gonna do? Guys are out here selling uh, Kindle and Valvoline and all these oils for about what our new OV is, but way under the price of a typical Mobile One synthetic or an Amsoil, you know, signature series synthetic. So if you're gonna stay competitive in the market, you've got to address that market. You can't just let it fall. You've got to address it. So what do you do? Here's what Ansel does. They buy the Group 3 base stocks a lot of times, sometimes from Petro-Canada Corporation, but what they do is they buy it from whoever will produce a product that has the highest quality. And if you make really good Group 3 Hydrocrack, it's right up there pushing on what we call PAO-based oil. Now, I can tell you some shortcomings of it, and I will in just a minute. But there's the point. There's the point. Hydrocracked oil is synthetic. 
It's been synthetic, it's gonna stay synthetic, and there's no reason for us old timers to argue with it. It is synthetic, it are synthetic, it stays a synthetic, and we're not gonna win that argument. So now, how do you look at a hydrocracked synthetic base stock? And by the way, ANZO would like us all, all of us ANZO leaders, to realize that we need to tone down the base stock wars when it comes to synthetic oils. Because the truth is, if you're really good at what you do, you can make a hydrocracked synthetic that in certain applications, you can't tell the difference between that and a PAO synthetic. There are places you can. The number one place that you can tell the difference in a PAO and a hydrocrack base stock is when you put them into high temperature, low viscosity applications. The PAO base stock still handles greater temperature stress than hydrocrack. But hydrocrack, you can pump that stuff right down there at 60 below zero. Why? It doesn't have anything left in it. It's 100% pure. There's no wax, there's no impurities, there's no nothing. So it's the wax in petroleum oil that crystallizes at cold temperature. There's no wax in this hydrocracked oil. It, it, it's pure as it can be. And um, so I don't have any problem at all with selling hydrocracked oil, especially when the company goes far enough to say, we limit the miles, duration of miles on our group three base stock oils. We say it's 10,000 and regular for OE. They don't try to push the hydrocrack oil to the 25,000 mile in one year. That's reserved for the PAO ester-based oils that we have in the signature series oils. So, okay, now, now you define the hydrocrack oil for the OE and the SL. Right. Now what's the difference between those two? The, uh, the OE is almost exactly the same physical characteristics as the original XL. Anybody notice that by looking at the, at the data bulletins? It is, it, to me, if you want to know what I think, okay guys, I hate to tell you, you know, to Amsoil, but this is what I think. I think the original XL became OE, and the new XL, which has an increased additive package to give it a longer drain interval, became the new XL. Because when you look at that original uh, XL oil, and you look at its physical characteristics, it's TBN, it's uh, no act volatility, uh, uh, four ball wear test, it's high temperature, high shear. It looks identical to the new OE oil. Hmm. So, do I know that as a fact? No. I just look at the chemical evaluation and the laboratory testing and I say to myself, boy, you know, what do you call, if you call a dog's tail <laughs> a fifth leg, how many legs does a dog have? <laughs> it still has four, no matter what you call it's a tail, it's still a tail. So, to me, the XL oil has been improved. If you look at it, the TBN went up. It's better oil because they put a, a robust additive package in it. I would not take, hey Mike, I wouldn't take one second of concern about running XL oil 10,000 miles. It, it, just, it is a very good oil, the XL oil. And the OE oil, for what it's being recommended for, for normal drain, you couldn't beat it up in, the, in a normal drain. I mean, it's it overkill for a normal drain. Now, but you're saying that even though it's an OE, and that's the name of it, that basically, you know, it's, it's not that bad a thing. No, it's a good oil. In fact, I would put our OE up and say that it's, equal, it's better than the uh, Valvoline or castor oil or Kendall standard synthetics. If you look at the numbers, it's a better oil than those oils. Now, the XL is a true extended drain oil because we're saying it's good for 10,000 miles. I'm telling you, you go ask what Valvoline says, they say you change it at whatever the manufacturer changes, period. They don't put any extension on anything. Neither does castor oil and neither does Kendall. So we're saying the OE oil would match with that. But it's actually a better oil than those oils. If you look at its numbers, it's a better oil than the competition in that normal drain category. But there is right now no oil really we have the market locked up on the signature series. There's nobody even wants to compete with us. Mobile One Platinum Extended Drain Oil, 15,000 mile oil, is a good oil. It basically looks similar to Amsoil oil, and it costs similar to Amsoil oil. I mean, you can't put all that quality in that quart of oil and sell it for nothing. You have to sell it for something. Now, not Mobile One, regular Mobile One, but Mobile One Platinum 
Extended wear. Extended, it's called extended wear. Yeah. yeah, and that, and you know, they admit it on the website. They say they raised their additive package 37%. Guess what their additive package looks like now? Looks like a quarter of Amazon. Okay, no, no secret to that. Uh, you can reverse engineer anything. Okay. So if you are asked in the marketplace, if you guys are asked a question, you know, what makes your oil any better than the other guys? Um, all you really need to say is, well, it depends which, which one of the oils you're talking about. So the signature series oil, hands down, there's not the competition, just don't even talk about it. It doesn't exist except for that one oil mobile extended period. If you're asked about our XL or the uh, OE oil, the XL oil is the best uh, for the, what would you call it, the, the psychological effect of not wanting to go longer. That XL oil is an excellent oil to sell to somebody. 10,000 miles, and if you look at the price on it, it won't cost any more on average than Castrol Syntec or Valvoline Synthetic, and yet they're gonna tell you to drain those oils at normal drain, 5,000 miles, so I can go twice as far for virtually the same price. So it is an excellent oil to sell, and the OE oil is going to, I believe the OE oil will probably uh, begin to take over our uh, lube station business. I just see the lube guys out there because it's price lower, gravitating towards the OE oil because look, you guys have been around this long, I've already been in sales for years. When you talk to the guys that run the shops, they want to make a profit. There's nothing wrong with that. My God, this is America. We still are allowed to make a profit. We haven't completely gone socialism, you know. So the guys want to make a profit. So they look at this oil and they say, well, if I recommend this for five or 6,000 miles, I get it for a better price and I can make some money off of this. So don't be surprised when a shop says, hey, I want to start trying this OE oil because they simply just want to make some money. And hey, we don't make as much as distributors or dealers on the OE oil as we do on the XL oil. But if our customer is happy and he's selling plenty of oil, we're going to make money. If our customer is not happy and he doesn't sell the oil, we're not going to make any money. So it's good to be partnered up with that business to make some money. On that. So let me just say one thing about, I want to come back to because I meant to talk about it, was the difference between, uh, that you can have in synthetic oils. Uh, we talked about the base stock for a minute. Now remember I said that this hydrocrack base stock has no polarity sites in it, they're filled up with hydrogen. It's a non-polar, non-polarized base stock, right? Well, PAO, the same thing happens to PAO. The PAOs, they make them, and they put hydrogen in the last phase of the PAO also. Non-polarized, right? Now, we're not going to put additives in this oil. <laughs> you know, I'm the, uh, I'm the kitchen guy here, I'm the, I'm the chemist, and I go, okay, I got, here's my base stock, and I start to pour my additives in there, right? And I pick up my oil in my clear bottle, and I set it there, and I come back 10 minutes later, and I go, wow, look at that. Every one of my additives are on the bottom of the cord. Why aren't they staying in the oil where they're supposed to be? Because all the additives have a polarity and they need something to stick to. And they can't stick to this oil because I took all the polar sites and did away with them. It's non-polar, so I have a problem. My additives will not stay in solution. So I need what's called an additive fixing agent to fix this. I need something that glues the whole thing together, something that will stick to that uh, depolarized base stock whether it likes it or not and I'll stick to my uh, additive I stick in there and hold everything together. Well guess what? Uh, one of the most polarized products made in the industry are esters. Esters are just, you can make a lot of esters and it all depends upon how you make them, different molecular structures, all kind of things, but esters are polar, highly polar, okay? And so what I do is I go, well, okay, I'll blend so much ester into my PAO base stock that I get the right amount that when I put my additives in, boy, they're just fixed all through and they don't fall out, okay? But esters are expensive. <laughs> they cost more, the amount of ester we put in the quarter of oil may cost more than the rest of the base stock, okay? So it's an expensive thing to do, and, but it works extremely well, okay? 
Um, now, we will not know and probably don't need to know exactly when and how Amazon is doing their fixing agents these days. We just probably won't know, okay? But as long as those esters are being used as fixing agents, it's going to be clear when you see the test of mobile EP, extended drain oil, mobile, it, there's platinum, versus Amphil Signature Series, and you notice somehow that why is mobile sucking wind that doesn't look like it's comparing to the Samsoil? It's because mobile doesn't use esters as a fixing agent. They stop doing that because they don't make esters. And mobile makes about everything else, so they don't go and buy esters from somebody. So they use another synthetic polarized product. It's got a fancy name, it's called an alkylated aromatic. But it is a polarized product quite similar to a PAO. And they use it and it works wonderful. But those esters, when you use them, they act like some kind of anti-wear additive you stuck in the oil. They actually juice the oil up to perform better. Even when they're only 7 to 15% in the oil, they make the oil perform better. Because those big old polarized ester molecules, they stick to the surface of the metal, and they act like their own anti-wear agent coating the metal. They're very good uh, lubricating molecules. They're expensive. Um, and that's one of the differences between mobile and Amsoil right now. But I can't tell you that you want to you want to really bank on that difference because I don't know what Amsoil might use next week. And, and they have every right to use what they need to use to make a good oil that, that tests out really good and keeps them cost competitive. Okay, We want them to be cost competitive. We don't want them to make stuff that is so good we can't sell it because it costs too much, okay? So they need to be cost competitive and we have to give them, they, they've always made very good products that we can trust. They're gonna continue to make very good products that we can trust, so if they vary their chemistry and don't tell us and make a good product, we need to say, go get them guys, just keep the price right, okay? And they show all the testing. You can't even find this testing on half the other ones. You start looking for these different tests on different companies, you can't even find this stuff. So, Amsoil puts it out there up front. They say this is a product that you can trust. We make it. Now they've used esters in the past. I think they still use esters, but I'm just telling you that I don't know that that will continue to be the case. But esters are super lubricating molecules. Anybody know the company that uses almost exclusively esters? Redline. 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 Redline makes some excellent racing products. But let me tell you what is a shorted shortcoming a little bit of, of esters. We cocked them up to do the shortcoming. Since they're made usually from alcohol, they do not um, naturally withstand moisture and water very well. It tends to want to return them to alcohol that you're doing water. So here's the point. Um, if you made a 100% ester-based product, you have to do some really hardcore chemistry if it's gonna run in an everyday car, because everyday cars have to battle moisture. If you make it for a race car, it hits that track and drives a 200 mile race, it doesn't cool down the whole time until he's done, they come in and then they're gonna drain the oil out, who cares? You don't care about its stability with moisture. So one of the things that uh, you have to be careful, and this comes with experience that companies gain through trial and error, is learning how to control certain things. Esters also, depending upon their concentration, they will swell seals. If you have a seal and it gets ester in it, it's going to swell the seal. Well, you have to control that. If the seal swells too much, it'll bind on the rotating shaft and rip the seal out. So the type of ester you use and how much of it's in concentration will affect how much it swells the seal. See, these guys, listen, this stuff is, it's, it's both chemistry, science, and art making these oils because the things that you think are going to work out sometimes don't work out exactly like you want it, and then you have to vary your things and test them and come back and test them again and determine that you finally get the end product that you want. Now, the question is how much you're willing to mess with that. The one good thing we know about Amsoil, they don't consider that they're going to rule the market in the lubricating world, so they realize that quality has to be their watchword or they're not going to stay in business. So they're willing to tinker and tinker and tinker 
and, and use different expensive additives back and forth until they finally get exactly what they want. And it may cost them more to do that than if they took the cheap way and did it. But that's the old man's theory. That's Al Amatuzio's theory. You, this is what I want, the end product. Now you guys figure out how to make it. I want it like this. It's going to be this good, and I'll accept nothing less. And they come back and say, yeah, but it's going to cost a lot to do that. And he goes, well, then we'll figure out what to sell it for after you make it. The other oil companies a lot of times say, look, this is all we can price this at. So we work backwards. You can only put this much quality into it because we're going to sell it at this price. So let's take